This week, we see the war take a new turn. From Atlanta to the valley, we see the rebels put on the back foot as they lick their wounds. And with nowhere to turn, we is forced to deal with the grand assaults of Grant. But at the end of the day, the war goes to us. As Sterling Price advances on St. Louis, the civilians are brought forward more way than one. Leave nothing. That is the order for Sheridan as he moves to make the valley a barren wasteland, useless to the enemy. That doesn't mean he stops the pursuit of Early, but every time he was in a position to assault, the enemy were gone. So the two forces arrive at Port Republic, where the army of the valley feels confident enough to stand their ground. Cavalry under Torbert began a raid as infantry form for battle. But so great is the success of our mounted warriors that Early instead brings his force to bear against Torbert. But by then, they had returned to Sheridan, Grant and Army High Command want a movement further down the valley. Early is shattered, but Sheridan realizes his logistical line is already pretty long. He has to protect them, with 1,500 men sometimes, so instead he pulls back and begins the burning. To Petersburg, Union begins the digging at Dutch Gap. A canal, if completed, would allow Grant's gunboats to circumvent a Confederate battery, which has so far kept naval assistance at bay. Grant has even more planned. It's been a month since his last movement against Lee. Now is the time to strike. He hopes to use the army of the James to strike north of their namesake to divert attention, as elements of the Army of the Potomac move westward to cut off rebel lines of supply and communication. General Benjamin Butler and his army of the James have not had the best performance, to put it lightly, and history has not been kind to the Beast Butler. A more interesting name than he honestly deserves. But this isn't another blunder, but instead the best plan old Benjamin ever made. Despite knowing the capture of Richmond is impossible, he makes promises that whichever unit enters the Confederate capital first will be lavished with six months' pay and a summary promotion. Maybe I should join. Every man from officer to private except by the offer and the opportunity to capture this city. Once again, Butler knows his limitations. Richmond is a dream. He has near perfect knowledge of enemy positions and numbers, allowing for his unique operation a surprise attack on the center and right that would draw the enemy from their entrenchments. The long march to the battle fatigues the federal force, and Bomber tries to sell his trade, discouraging the white force. The Army of the James is unique, though. It has a large color troop composition. In fact, two color divisions are planned for the assault. Though low on experience in fighting, they have the world to fight for. Final sip of coffee before battle, and a brief respite, as the federal formations organize themselves. The forward pickets of the 6th USCT push back the secessionist skirmishers, and actually surprise the relaxing rebels. The guard brigade of Colonel Samuel A. Duncan charged the breastworks. But due to a miscalculation, the brave men of 750 charged 2,900 Confederates, who, incensed by facing black opponents, rallied to the defense. At a bloody cost, Duncan's men fall back, having lost 287 men. And Duncan himself is wounded four times. Colonel Draper serving under the same division, Paynes, as Duncan brings his men forward, another colored force, 1,300 men, strike where Duncan fought. The good colonel stables his men under intense fire. As the perceived insult of facing black troop holds the rebels' attention, General Terry begins to flank the Gray Line. The violent brigades of Payne's division joins Draper and strikes on its left. The rebels fall under the ferocity of Butler's assault, and the heights begin to fall. As the Gray Line breaks, the Federals storm the fortification to its west. The division of George Stannard quickly routes the rebels, though at a cost. All commanders are wounded. General Hiram Burnham falls. But in his honor, it's renamed after him. Ord moves to rally a supporting assault, but is struck. The assault is paused as rebel ironclads appear and to reform Union command. For the 29th ends, we have won. General Robert E. Lee realizes he has lost an important position and orders a counter-assault, drawing thousands of men against Mayor General Godfrey Weitzel. Rebel commander, Charles Field, fails in his reconquest. The cost for the Union is high, and the rebels low, but the land has been taken. Most importantly of all, Lee has weakened his line. The reinforcement of Field has opened the way for Grant. The weakened Corp Hill is quickly put on the back foot as General Charles Griffin takes Fort Archer. The rebel line breaks. But as night approaches, as the Union grows confident, Rebel Henry Heth leads a counterattack and breaks the Ninth Corps, capturing a brigade. General Warren of the Fifth Corps, who is in charge of the battle, moves to rally the Ninth, contain Heth, and as the day ends, both sides know the battle will continue. As it stands, the Union has won, at a heavy cost. My Missouri has seen the return of the secessionist Sterling Price, a general and politician who hopes his 
personal popularity among the populace will bring the show-me state south. He is mistaken. The 25th, a skirmish at Farmington down south, and the 27th at Fort Davidson, the first battle of the campaign. Virginal Thomas Ewing Jr. has 1,500 men to hold onto the fortification, of which only 900 are useful. But the position he holds is strong, and that means before him are low on supplies. Rebel riders Fagan and Marmaduke arrive with around 6,000 men ready to storm the fort. Numbers vary wildly from 5,700 to over 8,000. The charge of the Confederates bring them into the moat before the walls of Ewing, where they receive the rifle fire and cannon shot that would scare the most brave souls alive. The ranks of the rebels are broken, and each assault is beaten back at a grave cost. Secessionist commanders determine to bring battle again the 28th, spending the night constructing ladders. Ewing won't give them a chance, evacuating that night and blowing up the fort. While the Greys get to claim the land, technically a victory, they lost 1,000 men and wasted ammunition arms they can't replace. Furthermore, if this is what one garrison can do, what does the Corps of Andrew Jackson Smith at St. Louis have in store for them? The rebels see no great deal of support. The reason why is clear. The exact same day as the Battle for Davidson, a gang under bushwhacker Bloody Bill Anderson massacred 22 unarmed federal soldiers, the most monstrous and inhumane atrocities ever perpetrated by beings wearing the form of man. While some support the crime, it deeply distraughts most Missourians. The following battle, where an under-equipped federal unit loses to a reinforced Anderson, sees further massacre of surrendered soldiers. While Anderson is supposedly supporting Sterling in the Confederate campaign, and actually, they're disconnected marauders. Price's pursuit of Ewing sees no success, and instead leaves his flanks open as federal forces move to reinforce Rolla. 24th, William Dennison becomes the Postmaster General. I can't find any big record of his cabinet career or changes he made. Now to Forrest. The 24th, he forces federal forces into a fort. 25th, he bombards the Union and accepts the surrender. The next day, he skirmishes near Pulaski, and later on, skirmishes near Lynchburg. He sees success, but it's a far cry from his previous impact. The devil has no horns. President Davis and Hood are hoping to fulfill the wishes of Forrest and take back Tennessee. The general hopes that a push towards the long rail supply line that ends in Atlanta would force Sherman from the state of Georgia. The federal force would be split to properly defend the tracks, allowing for the weaker rebels to strike a separate opponent and defeat them in detail. Reluctantly, Davis gives his approval, because there is no better option, Nashville or bust. Hopefully the pro-Confederate civilians of the state would rally and strengthen the beleaguered hood. Davis receives a request from John Bell, the removal of Hardy. He grants on the 28th, though Hardy was also asking for a transfer, which he gets, Department of South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. General Benjamin Chatham takes over Hardy's corps. The same day, Davis considers placing General Beauregard in command of the West, so someone else can deal with the headache. Wilmington, North Carolina, home to the blockade runners and Confederate cruisers. The rebel navy is in dire straits, with the CSS North Carolina being sunk by worms. <laughs> and increasingly daring Union reconnaissance missions. Admiral David Dixon Porter takes over the blockade of Wilmington, and the final action of the week saw a British blockade runner run aground and set alight, which causes, which causes a minor diplomatic squabble. Sickles time. The 29th, he declines to run for the House. I can only adhere to a resolution formed when I entered the military service to retire altogether from politics. But he is still a free citizen to speak and strike against the Chicago platform. Until the Constitution laws are vindicated and their supremacy throughout the land, the government should be confided to no hands that will hesitate to employ all the power of the nation to put down the rebellion. The resources of the insurgents are already so far exhausted that they will give up the struggle as soon as a majority of the people at the ballot box demand the unconditional surrender of the enemy. That's where the week ends. And let me say, Sickles is absolutely right. The fate of the nation is in the hands of the people, not the generals. We see it clearly from California to Maine. The citizens must ask themselves, is the cost of the Constitution one they are willing to pay? The men on the field are willing to lay down their lives. But are their families willing to make the same sacrifice? Hello, this is the entire Civil War week by week team here. I'd like to thank you for watching. It has been an honor reporting, well, I really can't call it news, the Civil War to you each week. And I do hope to see you next time.